Great. Okay. Well, welcome everybody back from lunch. Um, my talk is called Let's Web Dev like it's 1999. So we'll have lots of fun talking about this. But uh, actually, quick show of hands. How many of you were doing web development back in 1999? Show of hands. Okay, a few of us. Okay, veterans that were doing it back then. Awesome. So I'm hoping to share a little bit about my uh, developer story and, you know, take us down a, a walk down memory lane for those of us who were developing back then. And for everybody else, it'll be a nice history lesson on what web development was like back then. Um, so, and hopefully we'll learn some things along the way, some things that happened in the past, some things um, currently, and we can appreciate where we are now based upon how things used to be, okay? So uh, since it's after lunch, right, I'm not gonna try to wreck your brain or whatever, you know, with uh, like, whole bunch of learning. This should hopefully be something that you can kind of sit back and enjoy and just kind of take it all in. And um, for those of you who are interested, the slides, um, I already tweeted out a link to the slides. So if you go to my Twitter handle, at BenMVP, you'll be able to find a, a tweet there or there's a little bit.ly link at the bottom left there that you can also follow to, to get to the slides. Okay, but before you sit down and relax. I want everyone to stand up. I get everyone to stand up with me, please. So it is after lunch. I do want you to relax, but I don't want you to uh, fall asleep, okay? So we're going to do 10 squats together. Yeah, all together in unison, okay? But if you don't want to do it, don't feel pressured to do it. It's perfectly fine or whatever. Just a little fun to get the blood flowing so that everybody will be awake during the talk, okay? So we'll do it together. Ready? I'll count to 10. You can count with me. Here we go. Ready? One, yep, we're doing it. Two, three, yep, keep going. Four, five, nice form. Six, seven, almost there. Eight, nine, and ten. Nicely done, nicely done. All right, cool. So now, now we've got the blood flowing. Now we're ready. Now we're excited to take it all in. Okay, so um, like the introduction said, my name is Ben Alegbadu. I'm a Christian, a husband, and a father. This is a picture of my family, my wife Rashida there. We've been married for, we celebrated our ninth anniversary last week, so nine years. Thank you. Awesome. And we have three kids together. Um, my oldest, our oldest, Simone, she's five and a half years old. The one in the middle, Avery, she just turned three two weeks ago. And then our son, Asher, turns eight months old today, actually. And he's still learning how to smile in pictures. But we're working, <laughs> we're working on that with him. So, um, as she said, I'm a huge basketball fan, right? Huge NBA fan. So congrats to the Toronto Raptors fans here for the win. Awesome, awesome. So even though I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, I am actually from Houston, okay? So I'm a Houston Rockets fan, and the Warriors have always been beating us. So I was totally pumped that you knocked them out. And you just like, you destroyed their team. Like, the people left their team. It's great. Nicely done. I am so happy, because now it should be our turn this year. That's the plan, okay? Um, but I don't want to talk about... Uh, now, me now, I want to talk about me 20 years ago, okay? And for those who don't know, this is a PlayStation, not, not a PS4, not a PS3, not a PS2, it's a PS1. It's the original, okay? So 20 years ago. So um, the very first programming language I ever learned was uh, BASIC, okay? And I did it in a summer program in 1998. I was actually... Um, privileged, I guess, with the opportunity to go to the summer, uh, the science, engineering, math uh, summer program right before I went into to high school. So I got to, one of the things we had was a programming course, and I got to learn BASIC. And um, then went into high school, had um, algebra class, and we all had to get these graphing calculators, right? I'm sure most of us remember them. I don't know if kids still use them today, graphing calculators. But yes, I totally used it in all of my math classes, in algebra, geometry, pre-calc, all of those things. So I 
found, I found out, soon found out that not only do these uh, calculators are great for doing calculations, they also run programs. And you could actually write these, uh, build these apps in them. And the programming language that these apps used was BASIC. So I was able to kind of take the, le the learning from uh, programming in BASIC and actually create apps on the calculator. And the first apps that I made were all these math-based apps. So I would create an app to calculate the slope of a line or create an app to find the hypotenuse or whatever class I was in, right? And then I would use these apps to check my homework and make sure my answers were right in my tests, okay? So uh, I figured, like, if I was able to build the app, like, I know the answers, right? I just wanted to, you know, double check. So it wasn't cheating, I, I promise. Um, so uh, then I started sharing these apps online. Of course, at that time, there was no GitHub, there was no App Store or anything like that, just various different sites that uh, will let you um, uh, post the, the apps. And then folks started asking me, like, oh, how do you build these apps? How can you build TI apps? So I started um, writing um, calculator tutorials. And I guess I had a teacher's spirit even way back then. Uh, so I first started building them as Windows help applications for anybody who used Windows back in the day. Um, so these help applications, they were kind of like this hyper card style where you could link between different uh, pages together and stuff like that, and it generated an HLP file that someone had to then download and install on their computer to run. Um, it was very, very hard to distribute. So I quickly realized that the web was the best way to have dis distribution. So naturally, I created a website. And I had to go to the Wayback Machine, and I found my very first site. Isn't it beautiful? Yes. Oh, yes. So I built uh, Basic Guru Online as a GeoCities website, for anybody who remembers GeoCities, okay? Uh, and apparently I was a guru in Basic, even though I was 14 years old and had just learned it, but <laughs> that's okay. Uh, and GeoCities was like the hosting service, the, the hosting platform back in the day. Uh, there was also like Tripod and Angel Fire back then, but I think uh, GeoCities was like the main one. It's talking about early 2000s here, okay? So uh, BGO, as I re referred to it, was a, a full web application. So GeoCities handled all the back end, like posting of emails or surveys or things like that. And I pushed up all the static front end assets directly to their servers using something called file transfer protocol, which was basically just me copying files from my computer over to their server. So um, first, I want to point out the logo there, which was uh, definitely created using Microsoft Paint, okay? And I took clip art from uh, PowerPoint, put it together with some Comic Sans, and bam, awesome logo. <laughs> and then two, I had um, uh, a trusty, dusty, hit counter that everyone used to have back in the day. Like, for some reason, we had to publicly let everyone know how many people had visited the sites. You know, this was pre-Google Analytics or whatever, so everyone needed to know. Unfortunately, it was busted on the Wayback Machine, but I promise it, it got to the tens of thousands. I, I promise you, okay? Um, and then on the far right, I had the current date because for some reason I needed to let people know what the current date was when they visited my site. But the cool thing about it is that the date still works from when I took this screenshot. Like, uh, that's the reason why JavaScript is backwards compatible. So 20 years later, when I visit my site, it still works, right? So that's pretty sweet. Uh, and then lastly, in this like big, huge blob of text on the left here on the home page, blob of text, I, I wasn't a designer at that point or really ever. Um, I said that it's best viewed, the site, in America Online, in AOL, because that's the browser that I was using. I said it might be okay in Internet Explorer or Netscape Navigator, but AOL was the best. And Netscape Navigator, like, wow, that's a long time ago. Uh, and it's best viewed in an 800 by 600 resolution monitor. Awesome. And then, you know, going forward, I had this weekly poll on the right, 
in this weekly poll, I was asking people about their internet connection speeds, like, you know, 14.4 K uh, kilobytes per second, or, you know, T1 and all these things. Like, I really wish I had the results of what that was 20 years ago, but man, those, those speeds are slow. <laughs> and then at the bottom here, which I want to talk about, and we'll go more in detail a little bit later, is I had this fixed frame, which was like navigation. So everything above would like scroll in the space, but then at the bottom was this fixed frame that had uh, the navigation here, there. Um, I am surprised actually that I didn't use a scrolling marquee or a, a blink tag on my site because they were super popular, but I guess, I guess I was a little bit more refined back then, okay? So just for fun, this is a look at what Yahoo looked like at, at the time. Um, if you can see it at the bottom, it says it's powered by Compaq. If anybody remembers Compaq computers, yeah. Uh, and here is Amazon at the time as well. Cool thing about this, also at the bottom it says Microsoft XP is now shipping. XP, <laughs> awesome, like so cool. Um, but now you fast forward nearly two decades to now, and here's my blog that I built using Gatsby, which is a static site generator. So it basically just generates all the static HTML that I used to write by hand two, two decades ago, basically. So it's written all in React. It uses Redux, GraphQL, CSS and JS, Algolia for search, Webpack, Babel, like all these different things, right? All to build a blog, right? Which is kind of a big change from what it used to be in the past. And then another thing is that a friend of mine just graduated from this Berkeley coding boot camp. And in this boot camp, in 12 weeks, they, had to learn all, they got to learn all of these things. Like, so it wasn't just HTML and CSS and JavaScript. It was also command line and Git, which are basically table stakes at this point. Uh, jQuery, Bootstrap, React they had to learn, Django, Express, MongoDB. Like, this is exactly what Chris was talking about in the earlier keynote, that like, we have to know like, all of this stuff. We're basically full stack engineers at this point. And this is all, this is like just enough to get an entry level job. It's crazy. It's like the, the bar for what's minimally valuable uh, to build a site is like so high now. And you know, we go to meetups and conferences like this just to hear about all the things we should be doing so that we can try to keep up, all right? But the bar before two, dec uh, two decades ago wasn't nearly so high. In fact, it, there probably wasn't a bar because we were just doing whatever. It was the wild, wild west back then. Um, so I want to go take the rest of the time to kind of go through some of the things that we used to do back then and compare it to uh, what we do now. Okay, so before uh, CSS3 Flexbox and Grid, we needed a way to lay out our pages, right? And many times we would have some kind of fixed navigation. Uh, either it would be a global header at the top or it'd be maybe a left nav that was fixed. Or in my case, I thought it was good to have a bottom nav that was fixed. But anyway, uh, we needed something fixed. So now you may think that we solved this with table-based layout, because that's all we hear about. But no, I'm talking about something that predates table-based layouts, and that's frame sets. I heard somebody whisper it, I think. Yes, frame sets. Like, and before I explain this code, I want you to take in this HTML, right? No, it's not React. Like, <laughs> no, no throwing up during my talk, please. <laughs> like, First of all, the HTML is in all caps. Like, we thought it was a good idea to, to write our HTML in screaming case for some reason, <laughs> right? Right? And, like, the attributes, like margin height and frame border, they're not even quoted. We just, you know, threw the number right after it. And uh, take a look at the frame. Like, the frame tag is not even closed or self-closing or anything. Like, I have no idea how the browser figured out all of these things. Like, the web was wild back then, and this is actually, like, I pulled the source code. This is what I wrote. Like, it's crazy. And so this is basically the layout um, of a contrived example that we're working through. So we have this frame that's at the top that spans it. So we imagine that uh, being like a header or something. 
and then we have three frames and columns underneath it, okay? So we'll say, like I said, frame one is the header. Frame two on the left maybe will be a left nav that's fixed. Frame four on the right may be maybe ads or the survey that I was at, um, the poll that I had, and then in the middle is flexible uh, frame three there that takes up, it's for the main contents, takes up the rest of the space. So let's look at this, this code. No barfing, like I said. Okay, so the first thing is that each frame pointed to a separate file, HTML file, that actually had the contents, okay? So there'll be um, header.html, nav.html, or whatever. So when you loaded a page that had frame sets, you weren't just loading the main page, you were also loading multiple other pages as well. And then, uh, secondly, the frame set could be aligned in either rows or columns, right? And then um, it could also be nested, so you could have a frame set inside of a frame set. And then also notice on the frame set that there's a special asterisk character, right, to signal uh, that the column takes up the remaining space, which is pretty fancy for 20 years ago, right? Like this is something we've been struggling to figure out basically ever since. Um, and uh, we got like the visual styling mixed up in the markup, of course. So um, frames by default had borders when they displayed, so we needed an attribute frame border to turn it off, set it to zero. Um, and if you left the borders on though, the frame was able to be resized by the user. So there was an attribute, um, no resize, to turn it off. And the last thing is this, this name attribute. Name equals content. Like, what was that for exactly? Why did we have to name the frame? Well, um, in addition to um, providing this grid-like layout that we had, um, we didn't want to refresh the entire page. Like we realized that the header is gonna be fixed, the left nav is never gonna change, so only thing that's really changing is the center content area. So in nav.html, we had the links, or I had the links targeting the content block. So anytime I click the, uh, click the link, target equals content, and it would only update the center part. Right, so we're probably used to doing target equals underscore blank, right, to open up a, uh, a new window or a new tab. But the target attribute has other purposes, it comes to find out. And um, this was the main purpose, is to target a specific frame for um, update instead of the whole page. So as you can see here also, for some reason, my li tags, I didn't close those either. Uh, I guess we didn't do that, or I guess at least I didn't do that. <laughs> Um, but, um, oh, by the way, uh, the frame set tag is now deprecated in HTML5. So we're not supposed to be using it anymore. I know. But browsers still display it. It still works, but you're never supposed to code in it ever again. Because if you've been keeping up with the latest and greatest in CSS, this kind of sounds like CSS Grid, right? And here's how you would could implement it using CSS grid here. So we've got our CSS on the right and then the markup on the left. So uh, I'm not gonna go through all the code and how that works. You can take a look at the slide later if you want to see it. But I want you to notice how the main tag and even how all of our HTML is now semantic, but the main tag comes before the nav and the aside. The nav being the left hand and the aside being the right hand. So this is for SEO benefit because the content is obviously more important than the, the nav or the right-hand um, side. But using CSS Grid, we're able to lay things out the way that we want, which is really great. Um, and of course, all this is mobile friendly, fully responsive all the way from small screens to large screens. The frame set was not. <laughs> okay, but CSS Grid is way too modern for us, okay? So let's go back two decades again. So here we have this schedule for a, a portion of the schedule for Web Unleashed 20, 2019, right? And all we want to do, right, is indent the speaker name inside 40 pixels, right? That's all we want to do. 
So naturally, we would use some sort of CSS selector to find those speaker names and then add margin left. Simple, right? Or maybe you'll use the bootstrap grid system. You would burn a column on the left and have an offset or something like that. But, you know, pretty simple in CSS. But what do you use if CSS doesn't exist? Or, like, maybe you can't rely on CSS existing in all of your browsers because some people have Netscape Navigator. Um, what do you do? Well, you use a one-by-one one GIF, also known as the Spacer GIF. Yeah, and I, I say GIF, not GIF, but yes, Spacer GIF, okay? So it was this 100% transparent image, so it was completely see-through, and it was teeny, teeny, tiny in size because it was one-by-one one pixel, and we used it to do pixel-perfect spacing before CSX existed. So uh, it would work in both the horizontal and vertical direction. All you did was just give your image a width if you wanted it to be in the horizontal, or a height if you wanted it to be in the vertical, or you could do both. And we use these things all over the place to space things appropriately, right? So there'll be multiple um, of these on the page, and like I said, they're really tiny. So again, you know, responsive design and development wasn't a thing back then. Um, we were always designing for a specific width, maybe uh, 600, 800, 768, something around those uh, sizes. But it worked really, really well in order to space things out. Um, you could also use uh, a non-breaking space entity as well. We also use this heavily because, as we know, um, multiple white space characters in HTML are ignored. So if you wanted to get a whole bunch of spacing, you would just throw a whole bunch of these on there. Um, but it wouldn't be exact because the non-breaking space respects uh, the font size, right? And if you needed um, text as, to line up with some other elements that you have, um, it wouldn't work. You wouldn't necessarily get it perfectly aligned. So the spacer GIF was the solution. And then CSS became a thing. And we had HTML and a CSS. And it was so awesome, right? No longer did we have to put text and link and background colors directly on the body like you see here. We definitely did that. No longer did you have to put uh, font tags everywhere for styling everything. And yes, I totally did this a lot. You know, not a span. Font, 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 font everywhere. And the font tag is like, it's past being deprecated. It's now obsolete. The browsers don't even like render it anymore. It's so bad, I guess. Uh, we still use tables for layout in, the, in this time, two decades ago. But uh, we no longer had to put the styling in the markup. We could now separate it in a separate file, separate our concerns, so that you had the markup and you had the styling. However, do you know what we ended up using CSS for the most in the beginning? Or at least what I ended up using CSS for the most in the beginning? It was to screw with the link colors, okay? So, um, let's see here. So, you know, we would uh, change the link color to be different. Instead of being blue, let's just make it yellow, or let's make it red, or let's take away the underline so that people won't even know it's a link. Or uh, the visited colors would, you know, when you visited a link, it would always be this purple color, and we don't like that, so we'd make it the same as the normal color. Let's undo that. Um, you know, when you hover over it with the pseudo class, now we could change the color, we could change the underline. Ooh, look how dynamic this is when I hover, it changes. Like, it was so cool. Like, that's, that's like, means nothing now, but it was really cool. Because, like, originally all CSS was doing was separating the concerns. It wasn't, there wasn't any kind of fanciness in CSS. It was just that separation to get styling out of the HTML. So, really, like, styling links and having this interactivity was like the best that we could do at the time. Okay, so now we've talked about frame set, right? And how that was used to build page layouts. We talked about the spacer GIF, which was for pixel perfect spacing. And we talked to, just talked about link styling, right? Which 
provided rudimentary CSS. But now I want to talk about something that's like near and dear to my heart, okay? And um, so here's the poll, not this, not this specifically, but <laughs> I had this poll, remember, on the right-hand side of my site asking about internet connection speeds. And as you can see, it has hard right corners, right, in the upper left and the bottom and stuff like that. What I really wanted to do is have rounded corners so it could be nice and soft and, you know, there. But I didn't know how to do it when I built the site. I was just getting started, even though I was a guru. But, you know. Um, so, because uh, I started to see the web was starting to do these kind of pods, as I'm calling them, right? these kind of rounded corner things. And I, I think like Yahoo was the one that started doing it and everybody started following. So all these sections just had, were rounded corner pods that have little pieces of content. Then rounded corners kind of went out of fashion in the late 2000s with material design from Google. And now they're kind of coming back. So it's like, it's all cyclical. But anyway, I wanted rounded corners. So you would think that I would just, you know, throw a border radius on it and be done with it. Because that's what you would do with CSS. But border radius wasn't introduced until 2005. And it wasn't widely supported until a couple of years later. So what did I do? What did we do? Well, to make a pod with rounded corners, you would cut it up into this three by three grid and you would go into Photoshop and you would slice out those corners, create images like blue top left 5px or gray bottom right 5px for like the border radius. You would take that image and you would put it into HTML and that's how you got the rounded corner, okay? And what HTML did we use in order to build this? A table, of course, right? So, in the top left, you'd put the image as a background image of the TD in the, in the upper left. You would put it as a background image of the TD for the upper right. And you have to make sure the header in the center could, could all be in HTML, but you have to make sure that the background's lined up and the borders lined up on the sides and on the footers, like to make it look really seamless. Like it was, had to be exactly the right size in order to, to work. So. To get the borders, you have to repeat it, and just all kinds of craziness, right? And imagine the performance of this. Like, every single pod could, would be at least four images. And if you had different radius, radii, or different background colors, like, it's multiple images that were loading for the page. But also, like, imagine, like, wanting to iterate on this and having to change the radius or change the border color or change the background color. You have to go back into Photoshop, change the colors, export everything, put it back into your code, save it, reload it, and then see it. Like, there was, I mean, there was just no iterating going on with this because that was just, a, once the designer decided what it was, that's what it was, okay? Nothing else. Um, and actually, funny enough, there was a small window of time where table-based layouts were shunned, so you couldn't do those, or shouldn't do those, but border radius wasn't fully supported, right? And I just don't want, don't want to talk about those times, because it was just, it was just all bad, okay? So we'll just pretend that never happened. Okay, and lastly, all right, so we know that backend engineers have always been saying how JavaScript is a toy language, right? And we get mad, or at least I get mad, because and say JavaScript is legit. Like we have ES6 and ES2017 and 18 and 19 and 20 and you know, so forth. Like we have all these syntax in JavaScript now that make it legit, like compar comparable to other programming languages. And we can use JavaScript to build highly concurrent, low latency APIs that are serverless and in Node, or we can create uh, super sophisticated front ends with service workers and all that such. Well, two decades ago, JavaScript really was a toy language, okay? I'm just gonna put it on there. And we used to do silly things with it. Like, when you arrive on my site, I would display an alert that said, hello, welcome to my site, right? Uh, you know, it's actually similar. I was thinking this is similar to those permission pop-ups you get when you land on a site now for 
wanting to give you notifications or read my location. It's like, no, I, I don't know who you are. I'm not giving you that permission. Um, but it's, it's the same annoying thing. So it's like, it's all cyclical. It's coming back. It's coming back. I was an innovator. I'm telling you, okay? Um, so, so many things we wouldn't do today that we were doing back then, like putting script tags in the head um, because those uh, block the render or doing document.writeline. I'm not even sure how many people remember document.writeline, but we used to use that to write document uh, uh, dynamic content in the page. Um, unobtrusive JavaScript wasn't a thing back then where we separate our JavaScript from our markup. So instead of putting um, uh, onload function and the attribute there on the body, we should use add event listener, right? And to handle um, user events. But we didn't have jQuery yet in the early 2000s because jQuery came out in about 2006. So back then we had to check for both attach event, which is what IE supported, and then add event listener, which was the, the standard. You know, I'm actually trying to think, like, imagine what it would be like debugging a site where every time you load the page, an alert showed up. Like, that would be so, so annoying. And I, I probably did that, yeah. Anyway, uh, speaking of debugging, we didn't have any debugging tools. Like, none. Alert debugging was all we had. Like, not even console debugging, because there was no console. Like, it was just alert. And we, we, we think console debugging now is like subpar, but like, yeah, we had nothing, only alert. And like sometimes I would have to try to figure out what was going on in a for loop and I would have an alert. And sometimes I would mess up and I would have an infinite loop and have all these alerts. And like, I, like now the browser tries to help you and say like, did you mean to continue to do that? But before, like, it's just got to quit the browser and start all over and go to step to loop iteration number 10 all over again. Okay. Um, and in IE, I was, I was just thinking about this. In IE, whenever an error would happen, everyone got this cryptic message. Okay. It's like an error that said, oh, an error occurred in this script. Do you want to continue running scripts? And like, this is the user of the site that gets this. Like, <laughs> like not the developer. It's like the user, like, no, yes, I don't know. What's the script? Like, uh, like, and this is just a new in the web. Like, people didn't know what that stuff was. And it would show for every error, I guess, if he said yes. So uh, it was a total usability nightmare, right? Um, but it was also motivation to write bug-free code, right? Because you didn't want any of your users running into this. And then... Firebug came along, and it changed the game in 2006, 2007. It's now been uh, deprecated, but um, Firebug was amazing. And maybe some of you have heard of it. Most of you have heard of it. It was originally a Firefox extension. It actually got me from IE over to Firefox at the time. Um, this was pre-Chrome, um, of course. And the best thing about Firebug is that I could actually see the CSS. Like, no longer did I have to do, like, red borders around things or yellow backgrounds behind things to see what was being applied. I could actually see the CSS selectors there, and I could debug the JavaScript. Like, now with all of our fancy web inspectors, like, that seems obvious. But back then, it was just amazing. You know, I didn't have to refresh the page to see changes. I could just change values right there and just see it live. Like, it was revolutionary. And it paved the way for all of the amazing inspectors that we have now, especially Firefox's. Firefox's is really good. Um, I don't think the whole Web 2.0 and Ajax revolution that happened, I don't think any of that happens without the de debugging that came with uh, Firebug. And Henri gave a, a great breakdown of web inspectors and tools that debugging that you can do. He gave that a little bit earlier before lunch. So uh, these days, we have all of this dev tooling, right, to make our lives easier, um, to ensure that we don't ship broken code, right? In the past, all we had was our desktop computer, and then we had FTP to transfer it over to the web server, and that was it. And sometimes we would work directly on the web server and break all sorts of things in production. Like with IE, if you had a dangling comma at the end of your object literal, it would break everything, just a comma. 
So now our code goes through, goes through this incredible journey from idea to production, right? We have like editors like VS Code that make writing the code so much easier, IntelliSense it comes with. It lets you know about unused code. There's all these extensions for all of these languages that it supports. There's obviously GitHub or GitLab, which is, like I said, table stakes at this point. But back then, there was no version control. Like, version control probably existed in the biggest companies, but for your average person, definitely no version control. Like, imagine you working with another person on a website and not having any version control and what that would be like. Like, we'd have to, you'd have to both be on aim instant messenger at the same time saying, hey, don't touch this file because I'm touching this file. Like, oh, man. <laughs> and there's uh, continuous integration like Travis that uh, can automatically be kicked off when you um, commit and Git. And it can run tests like Jest that you can write in Jest and integration tests. And it can even automatically deploy your code to um, GitHub pages or whatever. And we have Gulp, right, that runs build scripts and can do minification and all sorts of things. A um, couple of stories. Uh, I used to intern at Yahoo, and it was like a badge of honor to be able to hand write the most terse JavaScript in CSS. Okay, like we used to write our CSS all in one line. Each selector would be all in one line, no spaces. Uh, we would even omit the last semicolon to save that one character. Like it was crazy. Uh, and I had a friend who interned at AOL and they wrote no comments in their JavaScript code because they didn't want to ship comments to their end users to keep the file size small. All because we didn't have the tools for um, minification and, and removing that stuff. And then there's all, also Netlify, which people have talked about, which um, when you submit a PR, it can actually give you a preview of what the website's going to look like before you even merge the code. All pretty cool stuff now that we have. So that's it. You know, I wanted to thank the organizers of Web Unleashed for inviting me here to speak and share my, share my uh, developer experience and for putting on such a great conference that is shaping up to be. So if we can give a round of applause to the organizers for putting this together. Yes. Thank you all so much for your effort. It takes a lot of work to put on a conference. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this little ride on the Wayback Machine, right? And hopefully it gives you appreciation of where we've come from. So. The next time you want to complain about Flexbox and all of its weird property names, like what does justified content mean and stuff like that, just remember the spacer gif, okay? Thank you very much.